Welcome to the Jay Martin Show. If you're new to the show, my name's Jay. I'm an investor looking for the smartest home for my cash. If that sounds like you, I think you're going to like what we do here. Most of what we do here is interview money managers and investors who have been in the game longer than I have. So I can add either questions or conviction to my thesis about where I'm allocating capital. But sometimes what we do here is dive into the most sports specific aspect of investing, which is the psychology of decision making. Successful and unsuccessful investors come down to the same thing, uh, the power of good and bad decisions, understanding your biases, your heuristics, your intuition, and what causes you to feel a certain way about risk and opportunity and all of this stuff. And so that's what I write about in my weekly newsletter, and that's what we're talking about today. And today's topic came up in response to a couple of weeks ago, uh, my wife was launching her new business. Now, her industry that she works in is somewhat controversial. It's not OnlyFans, although I respect OnlyFans. I mean, I respect the hustle, go get paid. But regardless, her industry is frowned upon by a lot of people. And when she launched, she actually re received a surge of hatred online. And unfortunately, some of it came from people that she considered to be friends. Now, we sat down and we chatted about this because she was struggling with it. And I I reminded her, I said, look, when the lazy spectators start criticizing you, it means that you're doing something of consequence. So leave those cowards in the dirt. Now, that's how I feel about critics, to be honest with you. But it, it does raise an important question. What is the best way to respond to critics? And what is the risk of listening to critics? And that's what I want to focus on today. Because the answer is not straightforward. The risk, in my opinion, of listening to a critic is not that they're going to make us quit. The risk is that we'll stop voyaging outside of our comfort zones, right? Out there to the fringes of our thoughts. And we'll, we'll come and we'll trend back towards the norm and play it safe. The risk, therefore, is that critics make us conform. Now, look, I've been an author and a podcaster for a few years. I've received a large amount of hate for some of the articles that I've published, especially almost anything during the last three years has been quite triggering. No matter what side of any issue you land on, if you have a sizable platform, you're going to receive a ton of hate in response to your opinions, right? And so what I learned over the last three years is that never once did I get, uh, you know, some hate mail or some, somebody in the comments talking smack about me. Never once did it make me want to quit. But it did sometimes make me wonder if I was going too far into uncomfortable topics. And this is what I say when I say this is the real risk of listening to critics. The more we push into uncomfortable territory, the louder our critics become. The typical response, therefore, is to trim our controversial edges and trend back towards the center. And what occurs when we trend back towards the center, in effect, it means that we are planning for mediocrity. Now, who in their right mind would plan for mediocrity? But this is often what happens when we stand up, stick our neck out and speak loudly and people tell us they don't want to hear it. We trend back towards mediocrity where it's quiet and safe. Now, most people would deny that they do this. Most would claim that they stick their neck out and uh, they stick to their guns under pressure. And if people want to throw shade their way, they would cut their losses and move forward. But the evidence is quite to the contrary. Now, I want to bring up a palliative care nurse named Bonnie Ware, who worked in Australia serving uh, patients on their deathbed for 20 years. And as they began to pass into the next life, she would record their final sentiments, the last things they wanted to share with her before they passed away. And the most common thing that she heard from her patients after 20 years of caring for people in palliative care was that they wished they'd had the courage to live a life true to their self, not the life that others expected of them. They wished they'd had the courage to live a life true to themselves, not the life that others had expected of them. Now, after 20 years of listening to people on their deathbeds, this was the most common sentiment, was that people trended back to the center and they became the person that they believed other people wanted them to be, right? Mediocrity. Now, if you think you're the exception, trust me, I hope that you are. I feel like we owe a debt of service to Bonnie Ware for publishing this insight and frankly to the thousands of people who did not live the life they wanted yet have the generosity to share this on their deathbeds. I think we can learn from this. When everyone is going left, how can we go right? How do we stay original in the face of objection? And the answer is courage. But courage is rarely what we think. When we imagine courage, right, we often envision a warrior at the front of an army, 
right? Sword above their head, staring fearlessly into the eyes of their enemy. And it sounds romantic, but in reality, that's not what courage feels like. Courage more frequently feels like stupidity, right? It feels like moving counter to the best advice you have access to. It feels illogical, right? It feels like everyone else is wrong and somehow you're right. It feels like letting people down who wanted something different for you than what you wanted for yourself. It feels uncomfortable, anxious, and doubtful. It feels like all of this, right? Until, until the moment when we finally and fully commit. And then courage takes a new form. Now, a lifetime ago, I used to work on a ranch and a good friend of mine was a bull rider. And I used to spot him in the cage. So in rodeo, you know, the spotter will often hold the cowboy around the chest as he mounts the bull before he goes on his ride, right? The action starts when the cage door opens. But before that, you know, the bull is trapped in a tiny cage and the cowboy has to get on the bull's back and tie in and get prepped. Now, then the bull explodes out the gate and the cowboy wrestles to hang on for eight seconds. And I remember looking at this like 800 pound, muscled up, horned beast, just frothing in the cage and thinking, this is next level terrifying that my buddy is going to hop on this animal's back and, and take it for a spin. So after my first rodeo, I spoke to my buddy about his process. And he told me that every single time he was getting suited up, he felt like he had make it, made a horrible decision. And as he walked to the cage, he would have to force one foot in front of the other because every muscle in his body wanted to move the other way. But his energy would shift once he stepped over the bull's back, tied in, and looked at the gate operator to give him the I'm ready nod. He had passed the point of no return. He was fully committed. And at this point, courage turned from fear to focus. So courage is not the absence of fear, but the presence of fear, yet moving forward regardless. Now, I used to go through a really similar process when I was whitewater kayaking. I used to be a super aggressive whitewater kayaker for about 15 years of my life, and I would white knuckle down terrifying rapids. I loved it. And whenever we approached a big rapid, we get out of our boats, walk down the river and scout the hazards, right? And every single time, my primary emotion was fear and doubt. Whitewater kayaking is an unforgiving sport. People die every year. And I would stare at the rushing water and wonder what on earth I was trying to prove and to who. But as soon as I got back in my boat and put in my final stroke before going over the drop, there would be nothing left in my mind but focus and flow. So what can we learn, right, from bull riding and whitewater kayaking? It's that there's a tipping point that turns fear into focus. And that tipping point is full commitment. I want to share a piece of one of my favorite quotes with you by a gentleman named William Hutchinson Murray. Until one is committed, there is hesitancy. The chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans. That the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. Critics rarely make us quit. More often, they make us hesitate from going all in on who we truly want to be. So listen to the words of Bonnie Ware and her patience and leave your critics in the dirt. Because our place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. And that's obviously Theodore Roosevelt. Now, every Sunday, I publish an essay where I dive deep into topics just like this, because I believe as an investor that the most important tool in your toolkit is understanding your mind, the heuristics, biases, and blind spots that lead to success or defeat as we allocate capital in these incredibly volatile markets. I love writing it, and I'd love to have you join the team. I love studying this stuff, and I love sharing it with my crew. There's a link right beneath this piece of content where you can subscribe to my weekly essay, and hear from me on topics just like this every Sunday morning. All right, until next time. This is Jay Martin.